All right, so this is going to be a little bit different from what we normally do because we're not really going to be necessarily teaching the lesson on organic reactions for a couple of reasons. Number one, there's a lot of them, so we kind of need um, a different approach for that. We need a bigger block of time than what I'm going to have here. The other reason why I want to do things a little bit differently is because organic reactions, the way we normally do organic reactions anyway, is a very different look to how you are comfortable doing reactions. So I kind of want to get the setup done so that we are uh, familiar with what we mean by organic reactions, how we write them, how we represent them, and what our pri priorities are for them. So when we talk about an organic reaction, and I've drawn one here, um, because this one, if you were to look at it in some detail, has a couple of things that are a little bit weird. Number one is I've got this alkyne, okay, this triple bond, that's fine. I've got H2 on the arrow, PT uh, below the arrow, and then I've got an alkane. Now if you'll start looking at the details, then there are a couple of red flags that pop up. Now, to start with what an organic reaction is, or what do we mean by organic reactions, or where our priority is with organic reactions, organic reactions are always converting from one functional group, an alkyne, for example, to a different functional group, an alkane, for example. So what we do then is everything about how we handle, how we treat organic reactions is trying to focus on that, the functional groups. Also, it's a really important for you to be paying attention to what is the functional group and what is the functional group going to become or what functional group did I start with in order to get that product. Always pay attention to the functional group. That is the secret of the whole operation. I normally write it to emphasize the functional group, or at least the organic part. So for example, hydrogen is the reactant, the other reactant, but I put it on the arrow to kind of get it out of the way a little bit, to declutter my reactant product part. Uh, platinum in this case is a catalyst, but anything that's, just, let's call it reaction conditions. So I need a catalyst, I need uh, to boil it for a while, I need a certain temperature. I will sometimes write that under the arrow. And sometimes it goes on the arrow as well. It doesn't, it's no real hard, fast rule that uh, other reactants must go on top and other reaction conditions must go on the bottom. But I'm usually going to write this one like that, kind of a fairly standard thing. I also, I shouldn't say never, but really never do we worry about balancing these two things. If you look at the reactant and the product here, I've added a total of four hydrogens uh, to the reactant to get the product, but I've only had two written down. And the truth is, it doesn't really matter. I'm just saying, here's what I'm starting with, here's what I'm putting into the reaction. I'm not going to be balancing that. I'm not doing uh, calcul mass calculations with it. So the balancing part doesn't isn't important. It's more about here are the starting materials, here are the what it's reacting with, and here are the products. And I should have done that this way. It makes more sense. We are going to have certain terms that we're going to use, and I'm going to use them. And what that means is, uh, and it should be kind of um, meaningful, I guess. So for example, we have reactions that are identified as elimination reactions. Elimination reactions, something is being taken away. So in this particular elimination reaction, and it doesn't really matter, like you don't need to write that down, but I mean eventually we'll have that, but I'm starting with a alcohol functional group and I'm taking away the alcohol functional group and something else and ending up with an alkene. I'm not going to tell you what else I take away. I'd like you to figure that out. It's not just the OH disappears, something else is being taken away. But if you focus on just the OH part, you start thinking about these reactions as some sort of magic rather than bonds breaking, new bonds forming. We're going to have reactions that are substitution. Take something out, put something else back in, everything else more or less remains the same. So here I've got a reaction where I'm substituting an OH group, taking an alcohol group off and putting an alkyl halide group on. We can have oxidation. Oxidation is going to show up a fair bit. We're not really going to have to, to deal with it quite in this way. What I want you to think about in terms of oxidation or what I want you to think about oxidation is I'm increasing the number of bonds to oxygen. So here on this alkane, I don't have any bonds to, to oxygen. If I were to oxidize that molecule one step, I will go to one bond to oxygen. Alcohol is not the only option, but it's the one I'm using. If I were to increase the bonds to oxygen, oxidize it again, then I'm going to have two bonds to oxygen. And I could keep oxidizing it. 
that carbon to increase the number of bonds to oxygen. Now eventually the um, the end game for an oxidation reaction is carbon dioxide. So an oxidation is kind of like a combustion reaction except under much more control. There's no flames or anything else like that. But what I'm doing is instead of combusting, burning my reactant, I'm oxidizing it under controlled uh, conditions so that I'm increasing the number of bonds to oxygen. Can you go the other way? Yes, you can. We would call it reduction. We don't have a lot of those uh, in what we're going to be doing, but yeah, you absolutely can decrease the number of bonds to oxygen. Addition reactions is I'm going to be adding something, not just taking substituting, not just not taking something away, but adding something. And it's going to most often happen with a double bond where I'm going to be adding something across the double bond. So air, both carbons of the double bond get something. You'll notice with this one, one of the carbons gets something more obvious, the other carbon gets something much more subtle. And you have to remember that both carbons of the functional group, of the original alkene functional group, are going to get something. Now there are reactions that have show a preference. I didn't really have any back there. But if I look at this one where I've got the carbon-carbon double bond on the end, I could orient my hydrogen chloride two different ways, left to right, right to left. And one of those is going to be more likely to happen. Now we'll talk about the why it is later on, but for our purposes right now, the bottom reaction is much more likely to happen. And if you're wondering why is that, later. We'll do that later. Um, the me mechanism here isn't super important. We're not really going to be drawing a whole lot of mechanisms, but I want, what I want you to understand is with this addition reaction, the car double bond, the electrons in that second bond, the electrons of the double bond, those are the electrons that are going to be used in forming a bond. So the double bond has to break. The underlying single bond uh, stays there, but those electrons open up or those electrons become available and then the bond between the, the molecule coming into the, on the addition, those electrons are going to get involved as well. So I'm going to break two bonds, going to form two bonds, and then I have my final thing. That also, when we talk about why the preference happens, sort of plays into a little bit as well. Okay, not a long thing because there's just so much we need to do, but hopefully this gives you a, a bit of a decent handle or, or some background or a bit of a foundation in order for us to understand the reactions when we get them. And then it will be a bit of a long list. But we'll talk to you then.